Today's part is a relatively simple looking part, and I'm going to say that with a, a great deal of emphasis, relatively simple looking part, feed shaft. Now this is the part of the lay that spins and allows the carriage to transition along the bed by use of a keyway. Now that keyway right there is 132nd by 132nd. And for all of you metric guys, that's about 0.8 millimeters or that big. Pretty small. Now here's the shaft itself. Now the one thing that I wanted to impress upon you before we even start fixturing this or cutting it or however it's going to get done. And I know how I'm going to do it. Let's see if I can zoom in on that and show you. There we go. Great picture. Anytime you have material that's sheared off, you're going to have some degree of leftover fingerprint from that process. Now this end has already been pressed against a sander and cleaned up. You can see that the OD is nice and true all the way to the small break edge. But watch this side. This is the side that came out of the shear. So not only is it bent, but you can see how the one side hooks up and the other side is down from the initial impact. So although this is very small, and I mean very small, you might not even see that if you weren't looking for it. But it's there, and you're going to find that when you when you do this to a piece of round stock, you're going to mushroom the end, the dimensions are going to change, things are not going to fit. So it is really important before you start a piece like this that looks relatively simple, that you address the shear marks on the material provided. If this is sawed off, chances are you're only going to have a burr on the brake side and, and you know the down blade side. But it will need to be deburred, not to the extent of this piece though. That has got to go. So that is step number one. We're going to make that end look like this end, simply by pressing up against the sander. And then we're going to put this keyway in. You're going to like how that's done. Bulletproof. And no, I'm not going to use a 132nd end mill and baby it for 19 passes and take half a day to do it. Let's do it. Unfortunately, this is one of those parts that's... Uh, Fussy enough that you better have a little holding fixture for it. So that's what we're going to do. Start off by making the clamping fixture to hold the part. That is going to be the whole job because the slot's going to be cake. But you can't cut it if you can't hold it. So let's do that. The fixture that I'm going to use to pinch this shaft. This is a 125 diameter shaft. That's about 3 millimeters in diameter. It's going to be a simple two-piece fixture. A cap with a base. Bunch of screws to hold down the cap and a notch in the side of the base to hold the part. You can make the screws any size you want. Just make sure that they're close enough or biased to the part side and not the back side. Which is what I'm figuring out right here. I'm going to put a tap in this chuck in a second and just visually line it up. Make sure I have enough room, which I do. That's a 1032 tap. It's 187 diameter. That's approximately 5 millimeter. It's just a little under 5 millimeter. And yes, that is a center drill, not a spot drill. And believe it or not, I use center drills on everything except the CNC. I spot drill the CNC. Up and back with the clearance holes for the screws. Double check the offset for the alignment. And since the top is as wide as the bottom, there's really no need to move anything. This is a piece of scrap I pulled off the shelf. Visually line it up. Mark where the center hole is center everything up in the vise, and drill and tap the base fixture for receiver features for the screw. Over drill the tap drill for the threads. If you only need a half inch worth of threads, this is aluminum, who cares? Drill it an inch and a quarter deep or drill it all the way through, it really doesn't matter. No need to pick the burrs out and don't worry about them packing up and blowing up the cutter because the hole's extra deep. Now anyone will tell you that the most accurate feature you can make on a part is a feature made with the same tool in the same setup. That way there's no guesswork, you know where all your surfaces are, you know where all your moves are supposed to go, all your zero points, etc. So for that reason I am going to dust cut the top of this part with this end mill and then right then and there, that's my zero plane. I don't have to touch, register, find anything. It's already set. I'm going to then dust the front of this thing off ever so slightly, 
move the cutter down well, let's say 120. The diameter of the rod that I want to pinch on the edge of this piece is 124, so I'm going to have a four thousandths pinch. Just going to put a little notch in the front, but the depth is more critical than the Y move. So that's why I'm going to deck this off to establish my zero, come down exactly 120, put another cut in it. Here's a real strong suggestion for you when you're cutting the top of a part and you're using a cutter that's not as wide as the part, Cut it like I'm cutting it here. Make sure that the rotation of the cutter drives the cut into the center of the part. And just come up the other side and do the exact same thing. This will result in a much cleaner front and rear edge of your part and greatly reduce the amount of time you're going to spend on the bench with a file. Any table adjustments I make for slots and steps and such, I like to make with the table in motion in case there's anything going on from the uh, torque of the machine, from the power drive, whatever. As soon as I see a chip, I know I am right where I need to be, and I will set my zeros at that point. One rough pass, one finish pass, and this basically simple slot. More critical on the depth than it is on the Y plunge. But I'm keeping the Y to around 125, just so I can have a visual reference where the shaft is when it's seated. By controlling the depth of that particular cut, A very accurate depth. I can set my rod in here right now and the rod is just four thousandths higher than the back surface. Now the first part that I made will become a cap. If the rod is too high it'll have a tendency to reject the part when you tighten it down because you'll have a clamping condition like that. You don't want that. You want it to be as parallel as you can but know you're going to get some pressure out of it. With a quarter inch thick piece of aluminum like that, I think four thousandths is more than sufficient. I'm going to take a cut on the end of the fixture now down here to establish the x-axis point for the start of the slitting operation so that I can control the length of the slot. After making the reference cut in the end of the part, I know it's a 500 diameter cutter. I'm going to move over 250, which is half of the diameter of the cutter, or the radius of the tool. Zero out my digital readout, and I am not going to touch the digital readout on the x-axis from this point forward. That way when I put my slitting saw arbor in here, the slitting saw is on center as well. Here's a little insider trick for you. Whenever you power tap a part like this by hand, you may find that the screw is a little snug on the way in. That could be very well because the torque on the quill stretched the leading thread of the hole. Engage the cap screw about a turn or so and gyro the Allen key. This will assist in putting that lead thread back where it belongs and take the stress out of getting that screw in every time. Good thing to remember. Try it. When you load the part into the fixture, use a scale, use a parallel or some other straight edge and line it up with the relief cut in the fixture. Now you know when the decimal value on your X digital or your dial reaches whatever it reaches, you'll be at the center of the cutter and have a minimum length required for whatever keyway they give you. There will be some run out, but as far as the dimension is concerned, you will have full depth of cut to that point. Let's put the cap on, make a cut. Exactly like the setup for the tailstock spindle, I am going to raise the table until this saw scratches that red surface. When it does, I will zero out my Z and I will figure out how far up to move. This is a 32 thousandths thick saw. And this is a Patreon build, by the way. This saw is uh, handmade. So I'm going to make the 32 thou saw and it's a 124 part. I will use those two numbers to lower the table, which effectively raises the saw. Yep. 
And believe me, that camera has a much better angle on this than I do right now. Alright, for anybody doing the math in your head, I have to come down with the table 46 thousandths, it's just over one millimeter. Drop the table 46, that'll put the center of the saw on the center of the part. Make sure everything is secure. Let's do the cut. Part is securely clamped in the fixture, flush with the end. The fourth out pinch is more than sufficient, it feels really tight. And just for sake of using this saw the way I want to use it, I am going to cut conventionally. I'm going to cut left to right. So I'm going to start the cut at the termination point and run all the way out. The depth of this cut will be set by just dusting the OD of the part and dialing in the required depth. All right, let's have a little moment of brutal honesty here. I had the RPM way too high to start that cut initially, and I smoked the teeth off this thing. So I took it over to the sander, put some new teeth on it, and you can see the difference in the cut. You can see the difference in the burr produced for the duration of the cut versus where it started to go bye-bye. When it starts to smoke, it's talking to you, so you better listen. And that's exactly what happened. So before the cutter blew up or the shaft came flying out of there, I took it over and I put a new edge on the teeth. Parallels here just sitting on the vise. This is my slinger for the oil. You can see that it's all well contained inside and on the outside is fairly clean. Let's take it off, deburr it, take a better look at it on the bench. All right, these features are getting harder and harder to video and record uh, in focus. You can see the slot in the end. And that is tiny. Four inches long down the center and there is a bit of a bleed out on the very very end it's unavoidable when you use a sitting saw of course unless you're doing the whole length and don't make the mistake of thinking that the saws are indestructible because even though they're hard they can go up and smoke pretty quick keep them lubricated keep it moving and deburr it after the fact well the print calls for an 032 slot which is what they got but the key stock that they give you or the piece of steel that they give you is 035. So <laughs> in my world, this is not going to fit this. Not yet. So sometime downstream, we're going to show you how to turn this into something that will fit this because it needs some machining as well. This needs to be turned into a little L and it is the key drive feature that slides as the carriage moves. And this is the thing that you don't want to see your apron get tangled in, because I've seen that happen. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. This is a Saturday afternoon. That was a fun little project. Fixture work like a charm. Keep it in mind. Once again, stay well, stay happy, wherever you are. Thanks for watching. Joe Pye Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out.